Welcome to the, uh, the annual Kendall Lecture. Um, in association with uh, this lecture, one of the things we do is uh, uh, award the uh, MIT Global Habitability Award. And um, here to talk a little bit about the award is uh, Mr. Fred Middleton, uh, who's sponsoring the award. And Fred graduated uh, from MIT in 1971 with a degree in chemistry, and then uh, has a Harvard MBA, uh, which he received in 1973. Uh, he was a consultant with McKinsey in San Francisco after graduation, and then he and uh, his college roommate founded the uh, uh, GeneTech Incorporated, which is a biotech company based in South San Francisco, and uh, he served as a vice president of corporate development and the CFO there. And he is now founder and managing director of Sanderling Ventures, which is a biomedical venture capital firm based in San Mateo, California, since uh, 1987, where they work with startup companies uh, established to develop advances in biomedical technologies. Uh, he lives in Hillsboro, California, with his wife and three children. And we're happy to welcome Fred here to say a little bit about the award. Thank you. Um, thanks, Maria, and, and I will be brief. Uh, the Global Habit Habitability Award um, was uh, started, you know, with the intention of recognizing uh, students, uh, faculty members, or anyone in the MIT uh, community, you know, contributing to the knowledge of our global habitat and the sustainability of it over time. And uh, part of the reason being, you know, that my belief is that you know, the kind of quality science and work done at MIT and in this department in particular um, has an opportunity to um, enlighten, you know, the rest of the world and in particular, you know, public policy um, about these issues. And, uh, you know, I, th I think we're at the point where, you know, there hasn't really been yet uh, an enlightened public policy formed around these issues. And I, and I think it's the role of science uh, and the MIT community uh, to assist the rest of us in providing, you know, the knowledge and information about um, environmental trends affecting the habitat and the sort of public policy, you know, that would be enlightened to deal with it in the future. So uh, that's my thinking behind uh, making this award. Okay, this year's uh, recipient of the award is, uh, is Mick Follows, and unfortunately, Mick isn't here today because he's interviewing for a faculty position, so this award could not have come at a better time for him, but let me just tell you a little bit about what he did to merit this award. Uh, Mick is a principal research scientist in EAPS, and uh, the work that he did uh, is study of uh, mechanisms that control the flux of carbon dioxide between the atmosphere and ocean. And this work has been published in a series of papers in the last uh, couple of years. And in this work, Mick combines a, a deep knowledge of uh, the biogeochemistry of the ocean with, uh, with an understanding of fluid mechanics. And what he has been able to do is develop models that describe the factors that control the air-sea flux of CO2 and other soluble gases. And he's been able to distill uh, the essence of a very complicated process and, um, and express it in simple models uh, that actually come up with hard numbers that uh, can and are being tested against observations. So we uh, congratulate Mick. There's an award that goes with this. And um, uh, when he gets back, we will give it to him. But he is delighted and uh, asked me to uh, express his appreciation to, to Fred for this award. So. Okay, now uh, Ron Prin will introduce the Kendall speaker. Certainly, let me add my congratulations to uh, Mick Follows uh, for winning this award. By the way, it's worth 25000 I don't know why people are not mentioning that. <laughs> <laughs> Depending on who you are, that's a lot of money. For Mick, it's a lot of money. So I'm sure he, I know he's uh, very, very uh, pleased. Uh, it's my distinct pleasure to uh, introduce the uh, Henry Kendall Lecture, but before doing so, I want to say a little bit about uh, Henry Kendall himself. Uh, Henry, of course, was a Nobel laureate in physics, in uh, particle physics, and uh, a very remarkable scientist. But uh, this uh, lecture uh, does not uh, 
memorialize his Nobel Prize uh, winning uh, work, but rather the work that uh, he did, particularly within the Union of Concerned Scientists, uh, about the global environment and great concern for what human activity uh, might do to the environment, uh, both uh, now and, and uh, going into the future. And uh, one of the things that uh, I hope you picked up as you came in was, uh, was this little brochure that uh, is, is a copy of the 1992 uh, uh, declaration that, that was sponsored by the Union of Concerned Scientists. Uh, it's called World Scientist Warning to Humanity. Uh, the text was very much uh, uh, the work of Henry and certainly championed by him, and it was signed by a very large number of people, including 104 Nobel laureates. And it just uh, you can read it at, at your leisure, but in reading it, it gives you a sense of, of the deep concern that, that Henry had uh, for the environment. I always remember that when the Center for Global Chain Science was set up and I was just moving into some offices in the 13th floor and I had on old clothes and I was covered with dust lugging stuff from the 18th to the 13th floor, that he rushed in and I, wondered, I thought he was lost, I knew who he was, and he said, this is a wonderful event that you guys are you know, finally you know, worrying about global change and so on. So we had a really nice, long conversation and I was most impressed with the fact that uh, when you talk to him, he was a very ordinary guy. You know, he just walked in the room and as I said, I thought he was lost and then he, he really had come for some particular reason. So a wonderful person uh, and uh, this is a wonderful memorial to him. Um, now, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce the, the sixth uh, annual Henry Kendall Lecturer. Uh, it is Dr. Jerry Melillo, uh, who uh, got his bachelor's and master's degrees at uh, Wesleyan University in 1965 and 1968. He then went on to Yale and got a master's degree in, in uh, forestry and then followed by a PhD. That was in 72 and 77. Uh, he, uh, in... Uh, 19, I guess 67, beginning in 1967, is that right? You joined the Ecosystem Center, or was it the... Uh, 76. 77, 76, that's it, yeah. yeah. 1976, uh, Jerry joined the Ecosystem Center at the Marine Biology Lab in Woods Hole, and uh, by 1988, he was the director of the Ecosystem Center, uh, and uh, he is now co-director of that center, uh, and has been uh, ever since that time. And uh, so he's really been in one place most of the time. However, he did take some trips to Washington where he did some very influential things. First, uh, he was director of NSF's Ecosystem Study Program from 1986 to 1988. And then uh, in 1996 to 1997, he was associate director for environment in the office of the president and uh, played a lot of uh, role in, uh, in uh, the Clinton administration in, uh, in uh, helping uh, uh, formulate uh, policy in global change issues. Uh, he's very well known for his scientific leadership. To just give a few examples, uh, he was chair of the US, United States uh, Scientific Committee on Problems of the Environment. That's known as SCOPE to those of us in the environmental area and a very important committee. He then became vice chair of the International uh, Global uh, Geosphere Biosphere Program headquartered in Sweden. He then later became president of SCOPE itself, International SCOPE, and uh, he's now president-elect and maybe about to become president of the Ecological Society of America. Uh, Jerry has won many honors, uh, including most recently he was elected uh, to the American Phil Philosophical Society. Uh, I've known Jerry myself for uh, perhaps uh, 17 or 18 years, uh, beginning with the, the IGBP experience, and we shared many uh, interesting uh, discussions. And it was in 1991, 1992 that we approached uh, Jerry to see if he would join the Global Change Joint Program at MIT because we desperately needed some ecosystem expertise. And uh, the great thing is that uh, he has he joined us and we enjoy many, many joint projects. So with that as, as an introduction, we are indeed privileged to have such an expert in ecosystems to speak to us today. His topic is changes in the land, environmental stresses, and the terrestrial biosphere's capacity to store carbon. Thank you, Jerry.
Ron, I want to join you in congratulating Mick on that award. And uh, now that I know there's money attached to it, I'm expecting to see some very fancy vests. Uh, <laughs> those of you who know him. Ron, I want to thank you uh, for the invitation to speak in the uh, Kendall Lecture Series. I knew Henry Kendall as a sailor first, a brilliant scientist, and a citizen committed to using science for the benefit of society. I'm delighted to continue my association with him in my mind as I talk with you today. Let me see if I can make the technology work. At the end of J.R. McNeil's Something New Under the Sun, an environmental history of the 20th century world, there is a table titled The Measure of the 20th Century. Many of the two dozen entries in the table are related to either fossil fuel burning or land use, the two primary drivers of changes in the global carbon cycle. Recognition of the human's capacity to alter the planet's carbon cycle has to be one of the major accomplishments of Earth system science during the last century. Our challenge for this century is to understand the global carbon cycle well enough to manage it to promote human well-being while protecting the biosphere and its life support functions. Now, in this slide uh, is the book cover from McNeil. And uh, he has reproduced Diego Rivera's painting, Man, Controller of the Universe. If you ever get a chance, look at it very closely. There are lots of people that you would recognize uh, through history represented in that painting. And it reminds us of the difficulties humans encounter when they try to manage complex systems. The message is proceed with caution. Today, I want to give you a terrestrial ecologist perspective on the global carbon cycle, with a particular focus on the factors controlling carbon storage in the mosaic of ecosystems that make up the biosphere. What are these factors? How are they functioning currently and how do we expect them to function in the future? Answers to these questions should help us to think about how best to manage the global carbon cycle in the coming decades. I've divided my talk into four parts. I'll begin with a quick review of the global carbon cycle, but as I look out at this audience, I'm not sure that that was necessary. Uh, and I'll stress the role of land ecosystems. Second, I will discuss the factors controlling carbon storage in terrestrial ecosystems and their relative importance in recent decades. Next, I will pay special attention to regional, regional scale carbon cycling. I will give you my understanding of how the controllers of carbon storage vary in importance from region to region. In the last part of my talk, I will give you my thoughts about the potential for carbon storage in terrestrial ecosystems over the 21st century. Here I will consider both natural and managed systems. Now I think we all know that over the past 200 years, humans have introduced about 400 petagrams of carbon into the atmosphere through deforestation and the burning of fossil fuels. The oceans and terrestrial biosphere have absorbed part of this carbon with the remainder accumulating uh, in the atmosphere. Numerous pathways, as shown in this slide, connect the land, atmosphere, ocean system. The dynamic behavior of this system is determined by the relative sizes of the different reservoirs and fluxes, together with the biogeochemical processes and human driving forces controlling the exchanges. Now, this cartoon, uh, which actually comes from a scope volume uh, produced in a garden spot, Ubatuba, Brazil, and Ron uh, was forced to spend one full week there as part of this activity, uh, notes the sizes uh, of the major pools uh, and fluxes. The human-driven fluxes and pools uh, are outlined in red, and uh, the natural fluxes are in black. Let me focus on a couple of, I've got it right here, and it's green, so I think we're going to be in good shape. Uh, let me focus on a couple of the fluxes. This is the natural flux between 
uh, the land and the atmosphere. And just let me define two terms, that term NPP, which stands for net primary production. And it is the net amount uh, of carbon uh, transformed into biomass uh, per unit time uh, by uh, plants. And the unit of time normally uh, is a year. And so this flux represents uh, 57 petagrams of carbon captured uh, by plants on net during the course of the year. And most of that carbon uh, is emitted back to the atmosphere through either respiration or fires. Uh, ocean fluxes are also large relative to uh, the human-dominated fluxes. And I want to point out two of the human-dominated fluxes that we're going to be talking about. Uh, one is land use change. And right now, uh, the estimates of land use change are approximately uh, a petagram of carbon per year, 1.2 in this diagram. And this other term, the land sink, which is the uptake uh, of carbon uh, across the landscape, and we'll talk about where in a minute, uh, by vegetation of all kinds. These fluxes that are represented here are averages for the 1980s and the 1990s. This is a fairly full table, uh, and I'll try to focus your mind on just a couple of parts of it. Carbon storage and fluxes vary by major vegetation associations, which we call biomes. Tropical forests contain the largest plant carbon pool, and they are the most productive. That is, again, annually they produce the most plant biomass. Interestingly, tropical forests also contain the largest soil carbon pool. And this is something that people hadn't recognized for uh, many years, and only recently have we been stressing this particular point in the global carbon cycle. Now, the tropical forest plant pool is being diminished by deforestation, and this is a prominent feature of the part of the contemporary carbon budget driven by human actions, and I'll come back to this again and again. Forest clearing in the tropics is estimated, uh, as we saw on the previous slide, uh, to be releasing about one petagram of carbon per year to the atmosphere. Parenthetically, I should tell you that this flux is not well understood and could easily be off by at least 50% in either direction. The uncertainty drives from two major sources. First, estimates of the area cleared each year, and second, the mass of the vegetation that is being cleared. A couple of other things I'd like you to notice about this particular uh, table. Uh, one of them is that uh, the temperate, whoops, sorry, wrong button. The temperate forests represented in this row contain large stocks of both plant and soil carbon, and in fact, in the global context, are the second largest carbon pool uh, in the terrestrial biosphere. And third are the, are the boreal forests. The take home message here is that forests are important uh, in the global carbon cycle. Yes? Sorry, the lay persons among us, can you just very briefly explain flux? What, what do you mean? What is, what is flux? <coughs> is flux just an exchange? Flux is an exchange, the, 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 the exchange in one direction or, or another. I'm sorry. The other thing to look at is this row right here. This row tells us something about, in this last column, the store of carbon frozen in high latitude soils. It is very large and, in a warming world, potentially quite vulnerable uh, to decay. The decay would result in either carbon dioxide emissions to the atmosphere or methane emissions to the atmosphere, depending upon whether it takes place under aerobic or anaerobic conditions. So this is sort of background information I'd like you to keep in mind as we uh, talk through. Again, the key points, forests are important. Uh, tropical forests are the major storehouse 
of carbon uh, in the terrestrial biosphere, and frozen soils contain a vast pool of carbon that is potentially vulnerable uh, in a warming world to decomposition and flux back to the atmosphere. Now, a less busy cartoon, uh, early 21st century, uh, look at the major uh, fluxes among the uh, carbon pools. We have fossil fuel burning releasing now over 6.5 uh, petagrams of carbon to the atmosphere. Forest clearing estimated to release another one, so that's 7.5 petagrams of carbon uh, put into the atmosphere. Uh, 3.5 of the 7.5 remain, and the oceans and the land take up uh, the remainder. It's also important uh, to keep in mind. Now, this is a cartoon, as I mentioned, because there's tremendous interannual variability in uh, these fluxes. And this is represented by this graphic uh, that was copied from uh, Sarmiento uh, and Gruber and then updated a bit. It illustrates the interannual uh, variability in the, the uptake very well. In the dark blue at the bottom, we have accumulation rate uh, of carbon in the atmosphere, and the units are petagrams of carbon per year, uh, and it looks like a cityscape. Uh, and in green, we have the accumulation of carbon uh, in oceans and land, not differentiated, just oceans plus land. And the point is that the amount of carbon accumulated in the ocean and, the, and in the land varies uh, substantially year to year, and uh, we'll talk about this uh, a little more later on. The main interannual feature of the record is clearly correlated with climatic variations, such as the El Nino Southern Oscillation, or major climate anomalies, such as the Pinatubo eruption. However, the variability does not seem to be equally distributed, and terrestrial ecosystems seem to be the culprits in the var variability picture, rather than the oceans. Now, back to this cartoon again, and it's the last time you'll see it. I want to focus on this land sink term, the terrestrial uptake term. And there are basically two questions of interest that I'm going to uh, talk about. The first is, where is the carbon sequestration occurring? With the capacity to store large amounts of carbon in wood, Forests are considered important candidates for storage. But which forests? Are we talking about the boreal forests of Eurasia, the temperate forests of the mid-latitudes, or the tropical forests in Latin America, Southeast Asia, and Africa? Perhaps the answer is all of them. We'll come back to this. The second question to keep in mind is, what factors are affecting the net uptake of carbon in any region? And I list here a set of candidates. Climate change, changes in land use, CO2 fertilization. This is the stimulation of photosynthesis. Uh, by elevated concentrations of carbon dioxide. Nitrogen fertilization, and here I mean inadvertent fertilization. Nitrogen deposited on terrestrial ecosystems uh, in rainfall. And in this place, each year, uh, about nine kilograms of nitrogen uh, per hectare rains on the city. And so basically, we're sort of eutrophying across the landscape with nitrogen. The final candidate is ozone pollution. And ozone pollution operates to diminish the capacity of plants to take up carbon through photosynthesis. So we have some things that are going to benefit uh, or enhance carbon uptake. They include uh, certainly CO2 fertilization and nitrogen inputs. And several, two things that definitely are going to uh, 
cause releases under some circumstances, changes in land use and ozone pollution, and then climate change, which, which can do uh, a variety of things, and we'll talk about those also. Now, approaches to estimating the fluxes between the land and the atmosphere. There are four uh, major approaches, which I've listed here. Atmospheric inversion modeling, and uh, Ron and his group have expertise uh, in that area. Process-based surface modeling, which attempts to build from detailed process understanding of ecosystems uh, to flux estimates. Extrapolations of in situ observations, such as uh, time series measurements of tree growth across large areas, and then trying to extrapolate the either carbon accumulation or release as a result of uh, those studies. And finally, uh, carbon cycle tracer studies that include uh, isotopes of uh, carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen in very creative ways. Now, first of all, to the inversion studies. This is a summary slide of a comparison of 16 inversion models and model variants. The data show the annual mean latitudinal ocean land distribution of non-fossil fuel carbon sources and sinks for the five-year period between 1992 and 1996. It's a bit of a busy graph, but very informative. The boxes represent a priori fluxes and uncertainties, those big uh, green and blue boxes. The crosses are the inferred mean fluxes, so that these crosses here are the inferred mean fluxes for those uh, latitudinal bands. Uh, and the vertical bars and open circles show the between model and within model uncertainties. The thing to note here, I've pointed to in red, right here, and that is that the northern hemisphere estimates exhibit substantial CO2 uptake on land. So if we're looking for contemporary carbon sinks, we want to look at the land ecosystems of the northern hemisphere. By the way, the sign conversion here is the atmospheric sign conversion uh, where negative numbers represent a sink relative to the atmosphere. I'll change that convention a little later on and I will remind you uh, that I'm doing it. While the inversion model approach can provide insights into the distribution of source sink behavior on large latitudinal bands, they do not provide understanding of the mechanisms responsible for the fluxes. For the past decade, a small but growing number of research teams, including my own, have been using process-based surface modeling to address the issue of mechanisms. We've been told where to look, and now we're going to try to uh, look carefully, and that's going to be uh, much of the message of this part of the talk. Now, we've developed a very simple model in our group, and several of my group are here, Dave Kicklider and Ben Felser, uh, and uh, they do uh, yeoman's work and provide tremendous input uh, to this activity. Uh, these process-based models are spatially referenced, ours is as well, and they use information on climate, elevation, soils, vegetation, and water availability to make monthly estimates of vegetation and soil carbon and nitrogen fluxes in pools. We run the model at uh, a variety of spatial resolutions, but the one I will talk about today is half degree by half degree, approximately 50 kilometers on a side uh, at the equator, although in the modeling activity, we carry along sub grid square or pixel information so that we uh, can provide some insight. This is a reduced form model, but one of the important things I want you to notice is that it contains both descriptions of what is happening to carbon and nitrogen uh, in terrestrial ecosystems. This is important, I think, in modeling global climate change because the carbon and nitrogen cycles are intimately coupled uh, in many ways, 
And very often, the carbon cycle rate is limited by the availability of nitrogen in terrestrial ecosystems uh, of the high latitudes, including uh, the ecosystems that we have outside here, especially the forest systems. L let me show you why one might want to think about carbon and nitrogen together uh, in a model that is trying to think about carbon storage. Simple question. Will the warming of soils increase or decrease the net amount of carbon stored in a land ecosystem? And I've put up here on this uh, little diagram some of the things that we think happen when soils are warmed. On the left-hand side of the diagram, point to soil warming leading to increased microbial activity and increased respiration. On the right-hand side of the diagram, I point to two other things that can happen. One is the lengthening of the growing season. And the second, and perhaps the most important, is the increasing of the availability of nitrogen. And the reason this happens is that soil organic matter contains both carbon and nitrogen. As the carbon is processed and leaves the system as carbon dioxide, the nitrogen remains behind, is no longer organically bound, and is in either an ammonium form or a nitrate form, easily taken up by the plants. So you want to keep all of this in mind when you're thinking about what warming of soil is going to mean for net carbon balance in an ecosystem. Two possibilities. If we have increased microbial respiration as the dominant response, we're going to enhance the fluxes of carbon from the soil to the atmosphere. Uh, and on net, if that is the dominant response, the system will lose carbon. If, however, increased nitrogen availability stimulates plant growth and the accumulation of carbon in the growing plants, and if that is a dominant process, we would have net accumulation in the ecosystem, although we would have some carbon loss from the soils. Is that clear? Does that make sense? So we set up an experiment at the Harvard Forest uh, to test uh, these simple ideas. Uh, this is about uh, 70 miles to the west of here in Petersham, Massachusetts. We're working in a uh, mixed deciduous forest, and we are warming the soils with three and a half miles of heating cable. Uh, the technology is the same technology that they use at uh, Mile High Stadium in Denver to be able to play football during the middle uh, of the winter. We called them, and they told us about how they did it, and they said, what are you doing? And we told them what we were doing, and the guy couldn't believe it. He called several people to the phone, and he said, would you repeat that? And uh, so, so there, there we are. Uh, but we've been doing this kind of work for a number of years at the Harvard Forest, and the results have been interesting. Initially, we had relatively small plots of five by five meters, and some of the trees were in and some of the trees were out, and it wasn't very satisfactory, but it was a deal made with the devil because we couldn't get funding unless we had lots of replication. Uh, and there was an agricultural uh, split plot design in somebody's mind that we had to uh, conform to. But uh, later on, as the, the first set of results came out, and we, we published them in uh, 2002 in December in Science, uh, we got additional funding to do a very large plot. So we now have a big 30 by 30 meter plot with lots of trees in it and lots of uh, heating cable, and the bills are becoming astronomical. And we're probably part of the problem, not part of the solution. Uh, <laughs> This is what we found. This is the set of results that we have after four years uh, of study. And let me tell you, from the original study, we found that there was a period of time, actually six years, when the soils were basically pumping out carbon at the rate of um, about um, almost a metric ton uh, per hectare per year. And then through time, out to 15 years, that dropped off. And at the end of about 12 years, actually, there was really no difference between the heated and control plots. Well, here we've been running this large experiment for four years, and the results are as follows. We see substantial loss of carbon from the soils 
90 grams per meter squared or 900 kilograms per hectare uh, coming out of the soil on net each year in response to warming. This is the delta. However, the trees are also growing faster and accumulating carbon in their wood. And after four years, we've accumulated uh, on an annual basis a little more than 50% of the carbon being lost from the soils. Now, if the pattern that we saw before uh, follows, then eventually we're going to see that uh, flux of carbon from the soil to the atmosphere winding down to zero. And we think it's because we're exhausting a relatively labile pool of carbon in the soils. And we're going to see uh, this vegetation accumulation of carbon continue because one of the things that we noticed in the earlier experiment is that once you make some nitrogen available to the rapidly cycling portion of the uh, nitrogen cycle in a forest, it stays there for a long time. And each spin of the cycle puts a little in the wood and puts a little in new recalcitrant organic matter. And the stoichiometry of the system is such that the C to N ratio in the soils, in the upper 30 centimeters or so, is 30 to 1. And the C to N ratio in wood is 300 to 1. So if you can move one mass unit of nitrogen from the soil to the trees, you get a big carbon benefit. And we calculated that uh, all we had to do uh, is move about 10% of the accelerated nitrogen cycle into the trees each year to account for the carbon uptake. So it's really sort of a, a marginal uh, benefit uh, that uh, pays big dividends in the long term. Nonetheless, if you don't have both carbon and nitrogen in your model, you would never be able to uh, predict this particular behavior of terrestrial ecosystems. The other reason for having Carbon and both carbon and nitrogen in a model is related to CO2 fertilization. And I'll come back to this, but I want to, want to say that temperate, boreal, and very high latitude ecosystems are basically, their plant productivity is basically limited by nitrogen. You can put all of the CO2 in the world uh, on those systems, and they will be minimally responsive unless you alleviate the nitrogen limitation. Warming, in its perverse way, has a chance of alleviating some of that nitrogen limitation. And so you need both carbon and nitrogen. And my last point is that most of the models of the terrestrial biosphere currently being used, for example, in IPCC, are carbon-only models. This is a problem. OK, now we, we attempt to uh, validate uh, our modeling activity in a variety of ways. Some of the bars, I, I have to admit, are very low, uh, but we're continually working at it. And we work uh, on validation across scales in space and time, from the Eddy Flux Towers uh, at uh, the Harvard Forest, uh, run by Steve Wafsey uh, and uh, Bill uh, uh, Munger here, uh, to the in model inversions that uh, Ron and his colleagues uh, are doing. And, and a variety of things in between, uh, including forest inventories. And we've worked with forest inventories uh, uh, in the US and also uh, in the tropics in a very interesting process. Now, in addition to uh, the modeling activities, I I've already shown you one experiment. But we actually attempt to conduct experiments across the globe testing hypotheses that are generated by the model. And I have three examples here. These are done by my colleagues at the Ecosystem Center. Uh, the first one on the top is a manipulation of land use in the Brazilian Amazon, and that's a project of mine, where we've manipulated uh, many tens of hectares uh, looking at different kinds of management practices uh, to evaluate the capacity of these systems to store carbon. This is in the state of Rondonia, the top picture, and uh, the area is, was originally uh, tropical forest, cleared in the 70s, 80s, and in the early 90s, converted into pasture. The, the C3 tropical trees were replaced by C4 African grasses that are highly productive in this area and uh, support 
uh, reasonable uh, stocking levels of cattle. After a pasture is in place for a decade or so, it begins to become less productive and less capable of supporting the animals. And so one of the things that uh, the farmers are doing is testing diff different techniques of rejuvenating the productivity of those pastures to make them uh, better suited for grazing cattle. And so they've got all kinds of schemes that involve the, the planting of rice and uh, cotton, intercrops, uh, different fertilization schemes and so on. And we're trying to test some of those and look at the consequences for carbon stocks. And having the advantage of uh, stable isotopes, uh, stable carbon isotopes uh, being different between the C3 vegetation and the C4 vegetation uh, helps us quite a bit. Uh, that picture there is a picture of the original soil warming project at the Harvard Forest. Uh, in the uh, early spring, and you can see that we've moved snow melt out uh, about two weeks early in this particular picture, so all of the heated plots are the ones uh, where there is no snow cover. And this study here is in the uh, Alaskan High Arctic, north of the Brooks Range, where we're looking at the effects of warming in, in these greenhouses uh, and the additions of nitrogen on the structure of these ecosystems. And uh, this is uh, a worn and fertilized system that has a tremendous amount of uh, woody vegetation growth relative to the surrounding area. And this kind of change, which is probably uh, many decades down the road in uh, the real systems in the Arctic, could have implications for albedo uh, and climate warming, et cetera. So we, we try to combine experiments uh, with our modeling, constantly testing the hypotheses uh, that we're generating. Now this is, a, again, a cartoon uh, of, our, of our model running at uh, half degree by half degree, uh, spatial scale, monthly time scale, and we use a series of, excuse me. Sure. The experiments are to look at the effects of a variety of agricultural practices on carbon storage in the soils of these systems. And, and these are common practices that are being put in place, and we're trying to uh, measure the consequences for biogeochemical processes, including carbon storage, trace gas fluxes, uh, leaching of nutrients to the groundwater, uh, and so on. Okay. Yeah. Maybe questions could be given at the end. Uh, could you? The thing is, well, we had a diagram here. Does the plutonium near some of the trees cause the additional melt, or is the snow being chopped away? I think we'll keep the questions for the end. Okay. Heating cable okay. under the under the soil. Yeah. Okay, I, I guess that's the convention, so I'm gonna, gonna move ahead. Uh, so this is uh, a listing of the uh, model inputs and some of the outputs. Uh, the inputs include uh, temperature, precipitation, uh, solar radiation, uh, atmospheric CO2 concentration, land cover and land use, nitrogen deposition, and ozone. And these are dynamic features that change over time. Uh, the static features are elevation uh, and soil type. And then the outputs include a whole array of uh, biogeochemical parameters, uh, many of which uh, are relevant uh, to global, global carbon cycle research. Now, I want to move to some studies that we've been conducting at the regional scale using this uh, modeling approach. And we've actually worked in two regions quite intensively. One is China and the other is the coterminous U.S. And our question was, how do the different drivers uh, of carbon storage that I listed earlier operate 
in those two places. Now, in order to run the models in each of the places, we have to have background information. And this graphic shows land use change over the 1990s in China based on repeated analyses of Landsat images taken over that time. It's a wall-to-wall -wall analysis. And it's an incredible uh, data set that uh, Professor Liu, who was at the Chinese Academy of Sciences, and his team produced uh, with the help of uh, our group uh, in the US. And there are some transitions shown here that are really quite revealing. Uh, changes of importance for the carbon cycle, for example, would be woodland to cropland, uh, grassland to cropland, and the expansion of urban areas. The uh, resolution here is uh, one kilometer uh, on a side, degraded to 10 kilometers for security reasons uh, by the Chinese. <laughs> and uh, I want you to notice the, uh, the Beihai Corridor, the Beijing to Shanghai Corridor, that red arc that uh, moves down the expansion of uh, urban areas. Uh, and this is occurring in this ancient landscape at a breakneck pace. And any of you who have been to China recently uh, will uh, agree that building takes place 24 hours a day, every day of the week, 365 days a year. So it's, it's possible to imagine uh, that uh, uh, this is happening and uh, Landsat doesn't lie, as they say. A Couple of things I'd like you to notice. This business of grassland to cropland, this is one of the biggest changes that is occurring in China these days where uh, grasslands are being plowed up and turned into uh, croplands uh, in the north uh, of China at quite a rapid rate. And there is also some woodland conversion to cropland, although the Chinese are trying to reforest areas, especially degraded areas, that have a high probability uh, of erosion. But this data set is really a treasure. Uh, and uh, it will allow us eventually to do some very interesting uh, land use analyses uh, in China. Now here is an application of our model trying to ascribe either carbon sink function or carbon source function uh, relative to the land for the major drivers we talked about earlier. Climate, CO2 fertilization, tropospheric ozone, land use change, and they're represented in the different colors. And what we have here is a cumulative effect of the various factors on carbon storage in the ecosystems of China over the 20th century. And the black line represents the net change relative to 1900. So when the slope is negative, the system is losing, that is all of China, is losing carbon from the land. And when it is positive, it is gaining carbon. Most of the century in China was basically a carbon loss phenomenon. It's only in the last two decades that the net carbon balance of China uh, is positive. Several other things to notice. Land use change is a major player in the carbon dynamics of this system. CO2 fertilization is a positive force for carbon storage. And tropospheric ozone is in playing an increasingly important role in carbon storage in China, reducing uh, plant productivity and reducing the capacity of plants to add carbon to the soils and to themselves and, and store it for long periods of time. Just a couple of things to point out. I wanted to point out the decade of the Great Leap Forward, 1950 to 1959. A lot of deforestation in China. Uh, to uh, fuel the, the smelters, the backyard smelters. Uh, the biggest uh, net carbon loss year from land to the atmosphere, negative carbon storage on the land, uh, the biggest decade was the 1920s. And on net, over the entire century, according to our model simulations, China lost 4.7 petagrams from the land. Uh, to the atmosphere. Same kind of analysis for the US. Again, th the same drivers 
being considered. Again, land use, a major player. Uh, nitrogen deposition in the US, a more important phenomenon than in China, according to our simulations, in terms of promoting carbon storage. And again, tropospheric ozone uh, appearing to become more and more important. Over the 20th century in the US, we have almost a zero net flux from the land to the atmosphere. Although over time, there were decades of quite substantial flux, 1920s, 1929, uh, large uh, forestry activities in the West, uh, agriculture uh, opening up in places and causing uh, uh, tremendous amounts of carbon to be lost from soils as a consequence of plowing and so on. The CO2 fertilization question, I want to come back to that. We have uh, tried to use uh, data from places like uh, uh, the Duke Forest, where they're doing these uh, open uh, CO2 fertilization experiments in forest ecosystems. And one of the things that the Duke Forest has shown in their experiments is that uh, there are differences in the ability of CO2 fertilization to stimulate carbon storage in ecosystems depending upon the availability of nitrogen. And they have uh, natural nitrogen availability gradients uh, across this set of uh, circular free air circulation installations. Uh, and the clear message that comes from them is that uh, nitrogen availability is critical. Back to the point that you want to have a model that deals with both nitrogen and carbon. Nitrogen, however, is a two-edged sword. While it may stimulate carbon storage, it can cascade through ecosystems and cause tremendous problems uh, of eutrophication of water systems, for example, as well as create public health problems. This is a a data slide from Chesapeake Bay, midsummer, showing uh, low oxy oxygen conditions in red at the top of the bay and higher oxygen below. The circles have to do with uh, uh, fish catch. But th the point is that uh, this is a serious problem, uh, the nitrogen loading problem, and, and this eutrophication is largely the result of nitrogen loading, a serious problem in estuaries all across the world. And so while nitrogen uh, deposition may enhance plant growth on land, it can create tremendous problems uh, in water systems. And if the nitrogen deposition is excessive on the land, uh, it can cause uh, dieback uh, of vegetation as well. Now I want to move to the globe very quickly. I'm, I'm well behind here. Uh, but I just wanted to say that, uh, as Ron pointed out, we've been working with the MIT uh, Global Change Program for the last decade. And we've tried to work uh, uh, within the framework where possible uh, deriving uh, climate change scenarios for the future, atmospheric chemistry composition, et cetera, generated uh, from a series of uh, economic scenarios uh, deriving uh, from the uh, EPPL modeling activity as part of the MIT integrated program. And I just want to uh, show you the results of one uh, experiment that we did uh, that is a policy-related experiment. And basically, we asked the question, how important is it, do we think, to cap ozone at current levels for maintaining or increasing carbon storage on the land. And this is uh, some of the work of, of Ben Felser. And just a couple of quick things about uh, this experiment. Uh, the experiment was run for the entire cent 21st century. Uh, the uh, carbon emissions resulted in uh, an end of the century carbon concentration in the atmosphere of about 800 parts per million and the temperature increase associated uh, uh, with the carbon dioxide increase was estimated to be about three degrees C increase. So here uh, is, uh, first of all, uh, down at the bottom, the consequence of having an ozone policy in place. And the idea is that with an ozone policy in place over the century, 
uh, with CO2, temperature, and ozone as drivers in this particular case. We held nitrogen uh, and land use constant. Uh, we see an increase in carbon storage on the land over the century with an ozone cap of about 180 petagrams. That is about the same amount of uh, carbon stored over the 21st century as was released due to land use activities from the 1700s to the present. So it's a, it's a large, uh, large number and uh, potentially quite significant. Without the cap, the increase is at least 20% less, at least 20% less. We have a whole bunch of variants uh, as to how we treat uh, agricultural lands and so on. But the point is that if you don't cap ozone pollution, you can diminish by a significant amount carbon storage uh, in terrestrial ecosystems according to our simulation. Now, moving quickly, as I think about the 21st century, however, uh, land use has to be the major issue for us. And this is an article that appeared in the New York Times uh, on the 29th of April. The title, Forests in Southeast Asia Fall to Prosperity's Acts, is a very interesting title. It has to do with large Chinese investment in Borneo to convert tropical rainforests into palm oil plantations. And the palm oil will be used uh, for biodiesel. Uh, so they're working on the carbon problem, I guess, uh, and climate change. The investment is large, $7 billion uh, dollars in uh, 2005. And this and other investments uh, have resulted in clearing of half of the forests in Borneo. This is what this, the sequence would look like, starting with the, the large diptycarp forests of Borneo uh, over to your left, the clearing down at the bottom, and the resulting palm oil forests. You are going to reduce, in a very substantial way, the biomass per hectare on the land that is converted from tropical forests to palm oil plantation. No question about it. These are large losses, will not be replaced. Uh, and so when you're doing your long-term carbon accounting, uh, we have to think about that. Brazil, the area of Brazil that I work in, Rondonia and Mato Grosso. Up in the upper left, an aerial picture of uh, tropical forests uh, in southern Rondonia. The clearing of those forests, and also the clearing of Cerrado here, that is savanna, and the planting down here of soybean. Soybean is uh, being used uh, as a, a food stock, it's being sold abroad, largely to China, by the way. Uh, and uh, it is also being used now uh, to generate biodiesel uh, for the Brazilian economy. So lots of this kind of activity going on. Back to Brazil again, and I don't mean to pick on Brazil. In fact, the Brazilians have some of the best records uh, of deforestation uh, that we have for the world. Uh, the government is clearly concerned. There are a set of regulations. They're trying to figure out how to move forward uh, in the land use area. Uh, and they're very aware of the carbon cycle implications, because I work with a number of the scientists there. Th this is a, a table that lists uh, the deforestation record uh, from the late 70s uh, to 2004. Just look at 2004 for a second. Area cleared, a little over 10,000 square miles, the size of the state of Massachusetts, wall to wall. Total area cleared, about 70% of the state of Texas. If you've ever driven across Texas, uh, it takes a long time. Uh, this, is, this is a large, large area. And so the prospects for carbon storage, uh, if this kind of activity on land, if this kind of activity were to continue, uh, is not a pretty picture. 
I'm getting near the end now, and I want to talk about three things. In the models that we run, we can uh, simulate uh, with, I think, some degree of confidence a number of things. Uh, maybe the, the best is, uh, and the easiest thing to simulate is the consequence of, of land use change, if you know what it is. But there are complexities and surprises that we want to think about. And I have three quick examples. Biogeochemical feedbacks. And this is a picture of the Pan-Arctic. And I just want to point out permafrost thawing. Remember, 800 petagram, or 400 petagrams of carbon sitting in frozen state. If it unfreezes, two potential consequences, either large amounts of CO2 entering the atmosphere or large amounts of methane or a combination, depending upon soil moisture conditions. Important biogeochemical feedback to keep in mind and to incorporate uh, in uh, forward modeling. Disturbances. Not human-driven land use change so much as wildfires in places like the boreal forest. They're a dominant feature of the boreal forest today, but the question is, how will climate change change the rate and the magnitude of the fires in the future? A lot of people who work in the boreal forest are now arguing that there could be a doubling in the rate of uh, fires, and this could be very significant in a negative way for carbon storage on the land. And finally, threshold responses, and this is a, a cartoon describing the, uh, the first, uh, I think, fully coupled model, land, atmosphere, ocean model uh, from uh, the Hadley Center uh, that looked at climate change in the future. And one of the things that their model projected was the drying out of uh, areas, especially in the tropics, and, and ultimately the conversion of the Amazon basin as a consequence of uh, soil water limitations from a forest predominantly a forest to predominantly a savanna, and the consequent loss of tremendous amounts uh, of carbon stocks. These are the kinds of things, uh, these threshold responses, that are particularly difficult to deal with, but things we have to keep in mind. OK, I want to sum up here very quickly and, and talk about uh, my look into a very clouded crystal ball. And I, I see the best case as being what I have put up uh, on the board. And I'll catch up with myself in a second here. The best case is a small amount of carbon, uh, additional carbon storage in land ecosystems in the 21st century. And let me break it down to those drivers that I was talking about. I think that the combined effects of uh, climate change and CO2 fertilization will lead to a modest increase in terrestrial carbon stocks of about 200 petagrams on the plus side. And I was very close to that 180 petagram number that I talked about. I think the effects of nitrogen fertilization and ozone pollution on terrestrial carbon storage will become progressively less important over the 21st century, especially uh, the first half of the century. And I think by the second half, they will not be issues. And the reason I think this is that there are a whole series of issues with uh, either ozone pollution or nitrogen pollution that are going to begin to command uh, the attention of local and regional governments for health, for crop yields, and for water quality. And I think they're going to be addressed in time. So I think over the century, they will become less important as drivers. And we might see, in our calculation, a small net uh, increase in carbon storage as a result of a residual nitrogen benefit. Land use change, I think, is clearly going to accelerate over the next decades and lead to further reductions in terrestrial carbon stocks. And I think that our challenge is to figure out how to make use of agricultural lands more efficient. I see more efforts to revegetate re degraded uh, lands for the, for the purposes of carbon storage, erosion control, and climate modification. But in spite of these worthy efforts, my feeling is that we're still going to lose 
about 50 to 100 petagrams associated with land use change uh, over the, the century. The bottom line then is this small increase of carbon storage in terrestrial ecosystems of about 100 petagrams. The small land sink could either be diminished or increased depending upon what happens with those complexities and thresholds. Uh, and I guess one, one of our great concerns uh, is that one of those will become a dominant feature of the carbon cycle and this 100 petagram sink that we're counting on for retirement uh, is going to disappear. Now, if our goal is to maintain or enhance our carbon stocks, what should we be doing? I can't give you very good answers, but it seems to me we need to uh, work on changes in the ways we use agricultural land. This seems to me critical. We have to use it more intensely, that the existing lands more intensely, and we have to somehow figure out how to reduce the biogeochemical communications between the agricultural lands and the surrounding landscape. I think reducing pollution uh, will help enhance carbon storage on land, especially the ozone uh, pollution, and it will certainly have ancillary uh, health and environmental benefits. And so in closing, I, I think that uh, while our knowledge of the global carbon cycle is incomplete, uh, we know that our current approach to managing the cycle is in the long term, not in the interests of humankind. Finding better ways forward is essential if we want to travel the path to sustainability. Thank you. of coal-fired power plants on the carbon emissions associated with fossil fuels. Uh, there are probably experts in the room who can answer this uh, much better than I. I'm sure that it, uh, it's significant. Is it at least 50% in the US? Some energy expert in the? Pardon? No. He was asking about coal-fired power plants in particular. Yeah, we were interested though in a in a number. Does anyone have one? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Chuck Cole. Uh, Jerry, in, in, your, in your model of what's happening in China, uh, it's, a, it's a very impressive model, but I was puzzled by one term, which, which I think is missing, I, the impact of both the primary and secondary haze on the photosynthetic flux. I mean, there's been a number of papers by some people like Bill Schmidt saying that the particles suspend the atmosphere, plus the particular matter just plates out on the leaves has a, a um, significant impact on, on the uh, productivity. Uh, is that not in the model yet, or do you not think it's in the model? Not in, in, in the model yet, but we've talked with Ron about uh, in, including this, because I do think you're, you're absolutely right, because uh, in in incident solar radiation is a driver. Yeah, in the integrated model, we are you know, handling both sulfate and black carbon aerosols, for example, and then that affects the amount of sunlight that gets to the surface. But I don't think we've run enough a couple of models to see what influence that would have on the carbon cycle. We haven't separated that. But it is important because it decreases the sunlight getting to the surface, uh, which will decrease productivity. So, yeah. Is pH, soil pH in the model? It is inherently in the model because the model 
uh, is specifically parameterized for each of the major vegetation types which have uh, soil pH gradients. For example, the, the temperate uh, and boreal forests tend to have fairly acidic soils uh, in the northern areas, uh, less acidic uh, moving south. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, well, that's one of the, that, that's one of the, the negative consequences of nitrogen deposition in the long run, depending upon how nitrogen leaves that system. If it leaves us nitrate, we have problems. I was very interested in what you uh, had to say about palm oil because I attended a conference recently which included leading people, leading analysts of peak oil, leading environmentalists, and leading energy scientists. And uh, a man by the name of Ken DeFays, who is known for his analysis of peak oil, was talking about um, his interest in investing in palm oil. And we had a very, and then Lester Brown, who some of you will know, came over and joined this conversation and gave some alternative perspectives about palm oil. Um, could you elaborate a little on, may I ask a little bit on the palm oil question, maybe expand a little if there's more that you might be able to say about that, but could you also say something about some of the other uh, changes that we're beginning to see and that people are beginning to, to promote or consider in terms of crops relating to biofuels, whether it be in the ethanol category or um, in the biodiesel category. Okay, the, the central point I was trying to make with uh, the palm oil is that you have currently ditrocarp forests that store about uh, 200 metric tons of carbon uh, per hectare in that massive wood. You replace them with palm oil plantations that store maybe a tenth or less of the carbon. So just the very act, having nothing to do with, with whether it's palm oil or not, the very act of clearing the forest and planting a much smaller stature system uh, has a tremendous impact uh, on the carbon cycle. Uh, then the, you know, the, there are related questions that one would want to think about in planting some of these uh, uh, energy from biomass crops. And that is, what else do they require? Water, nitrogen, et cetera. And th the environmental impacts could be quite incredible. I'm, I'm talking with a, a group in Brazil now that uh, the family owns 300,000 contiguous hectares uh, in the Amazon basin. I mean, this is a vast land holding. And they, have, they want to sell the property. They have five bidders for the property. And the bidders are interested in making a single biomass energy plantation. The land is divided into two parts. There's a plateau that is almost table land, an escarpment, and then some lowlands near a river. They're going to uh, grow sugar cane in the lowlands because they can irrigate it. And they're going to turn the entire plateau uh, into soybean plantations for uh, biodiesel. And the analysis is they could uh, produce enough energy to meet, I think that figure was, and I may be wrong, 1% of the transportation energy needs of Brazil from this particular plantation. So I think we're, we're going to see a lot of that kind of activity going on. And it, it worries me greatly, uh, because I think there may be tremendous false carbon economies uh, operating. There's been some considerable optimism about the potential for temperate forests to serve as carbon sinks in the past, but there's been some debate about that recently. Your, your study would suggest to me that the initial warming that we would see over the, the next several decades would actually result in a net carbon release because of the soil. Is, is that consistent? Well, in, in New England, we have a lot of nitrogen fertilization uh, going on as well. So it, it uh, the balance is, uh, f from a driver's perspective, not uh, so clear. We'd have to look at you know, which sites we're talking about. The other thing that we want to remember about New England is a lot of it is still in regrowing forests, having been uh, cut over uh, in the late 19th or early 20th centuries. In Woods Hole, where I live, if you look at a picture of Woods Hole in about 1905, 
It is sheep pasture. And now you look at it and it's entirely tree covered. So uh, this historical land use and the legacy that it has left us for carbon storage is uh, really very important to consider as well. I think uh, on the whole, the, the forests of New England are still regrowing uh, from the harvests uh, of the 1920s. And so I think they're acting as a, a sink, uh, and the sink could be stimulated a little by carbon dioxide fertilization and by nitrogen uh, fertilization. Uh, and the, the temperature warming could uh, reduce that somewhat, but, but I don't think significantly. Uh, I think the, one of the, the other things to remember about uh, these carbon sinks is they fill up, and eventually you can't put any more forest biomass in place, space, light, competition, and so on become uh, limiting. So th they're pools for a defined period of time. And then the best you can hope for is maintaining them at the pool size that they have attained at maximum. Yeah. Did I you say that in your model, at the end of the century, uh, you're looking at 800 parts per million carbon dioxide in the air? That was a... Uh, a model run generated uh, by the MIT uh, Global Change Group uh, that was, John, correct me if, I, if he's still here. I don't think he's still here. Uh, Chris, you, you, can, you can correct me. Is it uh, a bit, almost a business as usual? Yeah, that's a business as usual assumption that we don't do anything about. Right. Problem. And that's a typical, very typical number about the end of the century. Well, what I was trying to relationship to carbon to the temperature, uh, to me that's increasing the constant delta concentration about five-fold over the current concentration compared to pre-industrial levels. And the temperature, at least on the land surface, I think it's less when you consider the ocean as well, but on the land surface, we've already got you know, a little over 0 0.8 degrees Celsius warming since pre-industrial times. And it seems that if you increase the CO2 that much, the temperature would increase more than that, especially if you take Jim Hansen's work last year, that there's a lot of heat stored in the ocean, which will be uh, feeling over the coming decades on land. Ron, you want to handle that question? Yeah, I think that 800 miles within a particular forecast would have been accompanied by about 3 degrees centigrade. That's right. Oh, sorry. 10 to the 15th grams. I'm sorry, I should have uh, mentioned that at first. Oh. We don't deal with I understand. Sorry about that. Do you deal with gigatons? Gigatons. Or billion metric tons. Or